Luke chapter number 15 tonight. Luke chapter number 15. I'll tell you like Elizabeth Taylor told her last seven husbands, I won't keep you much longer. I just heard a preacher say that. I don't have no idea who Elizabeth Taylor is. Don't hold that against me. I could tell you like an old preacher told you his congregation one time, just take your Bibles and turn anywhere. I'll be by there directly. Amen. Uh, that's not going to be the case tonight. Luke chapter number 15, a uh, very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 11, if you're there, say amen. amen. Verse number 11 says this, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of good that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and they sent him into his fields to feed swine. God, I thank you for the opportunity one more time to stand and proclaim your word. God, in this short amount of time, God, I pray you use my scattered thoughts. God, you would just use me, move me out of the way. May God may I be filled with your spirit, and I say exactly what you'd have me to say, nothing more, nothing less. We can go around rejoicing and saying it's been good to be in your house. God, thank you for the, good, the Baptist Tabernacle, for this good church. God, I pray you continue to bless it. God, we'll thank you and praise you for everything you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want us to notice tonight this very familiar scripture, passage of scripture. I'm sure you've heard it many a times. Uh, maybe in Sunday school, maybe in vacation Bible school, or maybe even preached in a message. But I want us to think about it this way. There's always a place at the table. There's always... A place at the table. Getting right into the message we see in this very familiar passage of Scripture, beginning in verse number 11, that the Bible says a certain man had two sons. Doesn't say much about the two sons. Doesn't say uh, one was maybe stronger than the other one. Doesn't say one was weaker than the other. We just know that there were two sons born to this father, and the father had them on the farm uh, just doing farm work. We see this young man's day-to-day -day practice. We see his day-to-day -day routine. This young man probably just comes in and out, day in, day out, does what his father says. That's all he knows to do. That's his day-to-day -day practice. Well, somewhere between verse number 11 and verse number 12, I want you right away to begin to see how quickly this time frame uh, goes by. Verse number 11 to verse number 12, this young man, we, we go from seeing his practice, now we see his position. Somewhere between verse number 11 and verse number 12, the young man has decided, you know what? This farm life is not for me. There's got to be something more outside the fences of this farm. Uh, maybe the grass is greener. I've heard uh, people say the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. They don't always tell you the whole story, though. The grass is always greener on top of the septic tank as well. So this young man's position has changed very quickly. And he decides, look at verse number 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. Doesn't, you don't see a very big struggle. You don't see the father even saying anything in this passage of Scripture back to his younger son. I want you to see this, this young son is saying, Father, give me what's coming to me. In other words, if I read my Bible correctly, he's saying, Father, give me my inheritance. Well, you don't have to be a smart man to realize that in order to, get, to receive an inheritance, the person you are inheriting from has to what? Die. So what is this younger of the two sons telling his father? Father, you're, you're just as well as dead to me. Why don't you just give me what's mine and I'm out of here. Now I don't know about you. I grew up in New Bern, Georgia. And if I'd have told my father that, who's here tonight, if I'd have told him that, there would have been a new necklace around my neck made of tea. But we don't see that that father says anything to his son other than he divides unto him his living. We yeah. see his position. And can I just throw in right here? that I think our Heavenly Father maybe does that to us sometimes. Maybe when we decide we can do things our own way, we can we say, no, it's better over here, it's better this way, rather than what you've done for me, what I, whatever, I, what, whatever I've got with you. It's got to be better out there. I think our Heavenly Father, I think God allows us, you hear people, you hear preachers preach messages about God is love, God is, and yes, He is God is love, God is forgiveness, but also keep in mind God is a sovereign God. He doesn't have to do anything outside of be God. He doesn't have to do things because it's fair. He doesn't have to do things because maybe you just want Him to. He does things because He's God and He can do what He wants to, when and how He wants to. And when we step away from Him, I think God maybe just uses that for His honor and glory to show us that we are totally dependent 
on Him. We can't do anything without God. Let me move on. After seeing this young man's position, Father, give me what's mine. I'm gone out of here. Look what happens. And not many days after, the younger son gathered to all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with righteous living. Look, we've only gone through three verses in this short amount of time. And we see this young man going from everything to nothing. We see him having everything he could ever want with his father on the farm to absolutely having nothing. I'm sure you've heard this little, this little saying quoted before. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go. It will cost you more than you want to pay. And it will definitely leave you longer than you want to stay. So now I'm going to use a big word to describe this young man's uh, this thing that he's in. We see his practice. We see his position. Now, big word for Covington, Georgia. We see his predicament. Have you ever been in a predicament? Have you ever been in a, in a, in a bad situation? Boy, I, I seem to, predicaments seem to follow me. I seem to always get, in, if there's any kind of something to be happening, it's going to happen to me. My dad's here tonight. I'll tell this story. He'll probably remember this. The first time, you remember the first time I ever went driving in my truck? I decided I was going to be cool. Boy, I couldn't wait for the day that I could get my own pickup truck, go driving, and, 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 and come into town right up here to Kroger. Y'all know Kroger? They, they used to, I don't know if they still do now, they used to hang out in the Kroger parking lot. And boy, I was so excited. I was going to pull up my little Mazda B3000 little putt-putt pickup truck, pull up in that in the parking lot. Man, I was going to be cool coming down. I had my brother in the car with me. Boy, we were going to be awesome. Just pull up in Kroger. Old Chuck's got him a new vehicle. And I, I had decided that I was going to go, you know, get gas right there at the little gas station in front of the Kroger. And, and I can remember specifically telling my dad, Dad, I'm going to pull in here and get some gas. Jerry, you've got three quarters of a tank in your truck. You don't need gas. Get what you need and come home. No, I'm going to be cool. Just like this. This is all coming together, if you realize. I, I told my dad, no, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm all big and bad now. i got my own truck. So I pulled in the gas station, got my, got my gas, my Five dollars worth of gas to top my tank off. Circled out of that Kroger, and I could see people staring. Oh, old Chuck's got a new new truck. Whatever. Well, I pulled up to 278 and was going to turn left to head back to Newburn. And uh, I remember, boy, I remember, Mom. We we were we uh, always were studying for the driver's test. And I had my driver's manual. Boy, I studied that thing inside and out. I remember pulling up to that stoplight at Highway 278, turning left to go to Newburn. And I remember specifically. That in that driver's manual, that it says that it's okay to turn left on a red light. <laughs> I mean, I remember it just like it was, I mean, verbatim, written in stone, you can turn left, yield to other pass other cars coming your way, whatever. So I turned left. Thank God there wasn't anybody coming, but guess who was behind me? Oh. Newton County's finest. First time to ever drive a vehicle, and I got in a predicament, got my first ever ticket, all the same thing. So where Christians are not exempt, I know that's kind of a funny story, but Christians are not exempt from getting in predicaments. We're not exempt from, I, I've, heard pre, I've heard people say, well, I thought when I got saved that it was just going to be the big pie in the sky and the great by and by. No, that's not always the case. You're going to find yourselves going through heartaches, going through struggles. That song, Didn't I Walk on the Water, like I said, has ministered to me. The, the key line in that that spoke to me was, I searched until I found you. And I will do it all again. We have a Heavenly Father who sent the very best that He had to seek and to save that which was lost. But look what happens. We're still talking about this young man's predicament. I'm trying to move quickly. Uh, verse number 15. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now what's the significance of a young Jewish lad going out into the fields to feed swine? Swine. What are swine? Pigs. What is the one thing Jewish people don't eat? Pork. There's a revelation. You always, stepping out on your own, going into sin, always has its consequences. Right. And I see here that this young man has, has probably gotten himself into a place that he thought he would never, ever be before. He's like, man, I have walked away from everything I have ever had. Now I'm out in here eating with pigs. I mean, I don't think it gets any lower than that. And I can, I, can, I can see the disgust, the hurt, the anguish, the despair that this young man might be in. 
Let's move forward. Verse number 16. He would fain have filled his bellies with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Starving to death and just eating the best he could with pigs. Verse number 17. And when he came to himself. I want to stop right there for just one second and thank God for the day that I came to myself. I, like you, maybe some of you were like me, have some of the same testimony. Uh, I grew up in church, grew up walking with the suit and tie, took my King James Bible. I could come in and play the piano with the best of them. But all the while, I was kind of living the double standard. I was going in and out before my friends at school, trying to be cool, trying to fit in, because I know you find this hard to believe, but in high school, I was a bit of a dork. <laughs> Please don't laugh. I'm still going through therapy to recover from that. They didn't make glasses this fashionable when I was in high school. But, uh, so I was all the time trying to do the things to fit in. I, obviously, I'm not the quarterback of the football team. I wasn't the shooter or whatever you call it with the basketball team. I was, on, I was a band geek. But I was on the drum line, so cut me a little slack there. At least I did play something that was halfway decent. And I was all the time living a double standard, hopping the fence. Church, school, church, school, going back and forth. But I'm thankful for the day. And, and preacher, I made a public profession. Alvin Baptist Church. I made a public profession of Jesus Christ. And I thought that I was saved. But I, I say this all the time. The Bible says you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. And my life as a Christian was not bearing any fruit. And so it wasn't until December the 14th. I was sitting right about there. That's why tonight is just so special to me. I was sitting right about there. Brother Dave got up and preached a message on taking Christ out of Christmas. I don't even know if he remembers that. And it was like Brother Dave went in his office on a Monday morning to pray and seek God's face towards the message for the next Sunday. And God just spoke to him and said, Jeremy Chuck's been doing this, 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 this. And this is what you're going to preach. And he got up and did what God told him to. And I'm telling you, I sat right there and the Holy Ghost conviction power of the Lord Jesus Christ fell on my heart that day. And I have to confess, there have been times that I've gone in and out before maybe schoolmates, friends, and just cut up, tried to fit in all the while living the double standard. Can I say that a, a lost church member is just as lost as a lost man out on the street. There's no, there's no respecter of persons. Just because you can come in and play church doesn't mean that you don't have to go through the same blood that the lost man out on the street has to go through. And I'm excited to say that December the 14th I knelt down in this altar and Jesus Christ saved my soul that day. And it wasn't long after that that I professed my calling to preach. And I, can I just throw in here that I have never proclaimed to be the Christian that I ought to be. And I think you too can agree with me that we all struggle. We all, it's a day, the Bible says in another place about dying to our flesh daily. We have to daily die out to this flesh. There's nothing within us that is good enough to inherit the kingdom of God. i got to move forward. Verse number 18. Uh, we, so we see his predicament. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. He's kind of like a, just a, his moment. His little light bulb goes off in his head. I think he's pretty much saying, this is the Jeremy Chubb interpretation, how stupid am I? My father's got everything I could ever want and I'm perishing. I'm starving to death out here. This is his predicament. Now look, let's see his plan. What's going to happen? Verse number 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So we see his plan. He's going to go home. He's going to ask his father's for forgiveness and ask him to come back home. Not as a son, but as a servant. He wants to come back and because he, he, I think he realizes that even the servants are eating better than what he is at this point. So he, he, he begins his journey. And I can just hear the conversation. Maybe he was toying with the forces of good and evil in his head. This side saying, yeah, just keep going. Go home to your father. He's going to welcome you with open arms. Everything will be fine. Even if you are just a servant, you'll eat better than what you've been eating. He, maybe he, I mean, he'll take you back. No work. But on this other side, oh no. What if my father doesn't allow me to come back home? What if he doesn't? I, I pretty much told my father that he is just as good as dead to me. 
What's going to happen if he doesn't allow me to come back home? I've wasted everything. I'm out here living with pigs. I'm starving to death. What's going to happen if he doesn't allow me to come home? I think that happens maybe in the Christian's life as well. Kind of like when, we, when I spoke earlier about taking our eyes off of Jesus. Maybe Jesus is just standing here with open arms saying, You can always come back to me. There's always a place for you at my table. But maybe we try to step and do things our own way. Once again, keeping our eyes off of Jesus will always take us further down than keeping our eyes on Jesus will. So we, we, we see maybe in our minds, I just have to use my imagination on this, that he's trotting along, approaching the land where his father has his farm. And all the while his heart may be beating out of his chest. What's going to, what's going to happen if my father doesn't allow me to come home? Look what happens. Verse number 20. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was a great ways off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Amen. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to be married. So we've seen his practice, his pardon, his predicament, his plan to go home. Now, praise God, we see his pardon. We see his pardon. He goes home, and what happens? His father throws a party, basically. Fills, kills the fatted calf, and they eat, drink, marry. I think the party happens. Is that not exactly what happens when a lost sinner comes to repentance and realizes there's nothing they can do without Jesus and they're born into the family of God? I believe the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice over the repentance of one lost sinner. So what about you tonight? I see some of you I've seen. I was here the day you were saved. And thank God for that. Some of you, like Brother Bowen, Brother Moody, Brother David, I have, I'm so thankful for the heritage I have in my Christian walk. Men that I can look up to. Maybe, and, and, and they've been longer in the faith, longer than I've been alive. But can I say that it's easy to, to be weary, weary and well-doing? I'll just put it that way. It's easy for Satan to come in and still rob you of your joy. Maybe you minister all the... I've heard a preacher say before, maybe, maybe Brother David, you can only minister so far out until you can be ministered in Maybe you've come to the place that you've lost your joy. I, I, it's easy. With the crazy world that we live in, it is easy to lose your joy. Satan will do anything he can to try to deceive you and to tell you there's no joy in serving Jesus. So can I tell you tonight that there's a place set at the table of joy. There's a joy place set at the table. There's a place for the lost, always. To come home. You say, Jeremy, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know the things that I've said, the things that I've done. I don't have to. He does. And He died He died for the things that you committed. Amen. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You say, well, one of these days when I get my act cleaned up, one of these days when I quit this or quit that, or, can I just say, you'll never, ever, ever, ever be able to clean yourself up. There will never come a time when you'll be able to say, okay, God, Okay, Lord, I'm ready to be saved now. The Bible says that our flesh is corrupt. We're never going to inherit sinless perfection until the saved of, of, of God are called home. That day will be sinless. And can I remind you, there was only one man that was so much God, but so much man. He came, walked this earth, wrapped himself in flesh that was sinless. That was the only man. You know in the Old Testament, the story of, of Abraham and Isaac, there used to have to be a blood sacrifice. Now, thanks to Jesus, thanks to the blood that He shed on Calvary, He came to be the propitiation of our sins. He died and carried our sin debt so we don't have to. And I say that I'm thankful for the forgiveness of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Because I fail Him daily. Daily, I fail Him. And it's an honest to goodness every day. Lord, I need your forgiveness. And I believe it's just that easy. Amen. You say, Lord, I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. What happened to the, to the young son when he went home? The father said, you're dead young right. You're, you're, you ain't coming home to me. You're crazy. No. 
welcomed him back home with open arms. And that's exactly what our Heavenly Father does for us.